I'm Wendy Lowe, and I'm your volunteer buddy as we journey to take your health back. We are coming to you live from downtown Honolulu from the studios of Think Tech Hawaii, which hosts about 45 different diverse and colorful shows monthly. Today, our topic of discussion will be on building ohana in Uganda, from despair to hope, no longer orphans, but sons and daughters. We will be talking about rescuing frightened, abandoned children, providing their basic needs, and watching them grow into healthy, well-rounded young people with dreams of a future. What I would like you to take away from today's discussion is the idea that if we can do it, you can do it. It's less about our, ab uh, our ability and more about our availability. Today, we are very honored to welcome Chuck and Nancy Reed back home to Hawaii. They are the founders of King's Kids Africa. So Chuck and Nancy, I've known you for a while and we are kind of like travel buddies and I know we have yet to venture together to Uganda. So just tell me, how did this all get started, this King's Kids Africa in Uganda? Well, as we approach the end of our careers, we are hungry for something of purpose, something for God's kingdom. So as a first step, we took a trip to Uganda. While we were there, you couldn't help but be amazed at the hundreds of children that surrounded us. They just were all over and there was nobody there to watch them, no parents caring about them. And we found out that it's because they were all orphans. So as orphans, they just wandered around, not knowing who was gonna take care of them. And we saw this a couple years in a row. And when we left there, we thought, somebody's gonna have to do something about this. Wow, you know, there are so many countries in Africa and around the world with all kinds of needs. Why did we, why did you choose to have King's Kids Africa land in Uganda to start? Well, when we first started seeing the needs there, it kind of grew on our heart for a couple of years. And we decided because maybe we were the ones that could do something, we decided to start our nonprofit King's Kids Africa to help these orphan children. And so what have you, you know, what have you done or to accomplish? How did you accomplish King's Kids Africa? When we first started out, we just wanted to meet the physical needs of the children and to know, help them know their heavenly father. We like to say that we provided homes for love and physical care, schools for education to help lift them out of poverty, uh, churches for spiritual development, and then finally a community for social integration. Wow. We wanted them to know the love of a home and what it was like to be cared for. Amazing, because a lot of the kids, the keiki that you're working with, they're coming off the street. And like our dear friend Molly, who roams the streets looking for these keiki, is that pretty much what you do? Or do you get them, uh, do they get referred to you by the people of the community? That's perhaps the most challenging part of our ministry. Our pastors who we work through in the local churches in Uganda, they most, know most of the families in the villages. Um, and we've hired a social worker there. And so together the social worker and the pastors go door to door and find the children who are most desperate and vulnerable. The hard part is that sometimes they have to say yes to one and no to the other. And that's just gut wrenching. Yeah, that's not a good thing. So you talk about finding or building homes for them. How is that done? You're actually building homes or is it from scratch? Uh, what do you, how do you do that building a home in Uganda? Well, we've come alongside the Presbytery of East Africa, and we find the pastors who really have a heart for the children and the orphans of Uganda, and they're doing all they can, but they just need a helping hand. So we come alongside those churches and build small duplexes with five boys and a mom on one side and five girls and a mom on the other side. And along with the homes, we build a separate kitchen and latrine. So we decide that it's more about um, the children and their needs than it is about the brick and mortar. And we bring in a village widow woman to help become the mother of these children. So she's the one who cares for them in their duplex. Wow. So in Hawaii, we have a system like that. It's called Hanai. And so where the mama or like you, Chuck, or you, Nancy, could be a Hanai mother or grandmother or auntie. So you're uh, unofficially adopted these children and you become an unofficial mommy and daddy. So in our system, we call it Hanai. And so you're bringing that system to Uganda. I think that's incredible. You're building Ohana and you're forming the, you know, the Hanai relationship. 
But now again, back to that question. There are so many keiki on the street and, you know, like maybe two brothers or two sisters, siblings, but you can't take them all. So how is it determined who gets to go home with the new Hanai family? Well, because the caseworker that we've hired works with the local pastor, they know the village people, they know the children that are in most need. So they go around and they see which ones are left behind, some that are totally abandoned, some that have nobody, some that are abused. And even actually the villagers will come to them and say, please take this one, this one's being abused please take this one. No child is taken away from a home. Oftentimes an elderly grandparent who cannot provide for a child that had been dropped off to her or him asks, please, will you take this one? Wow. That's a tough call. You're, you're, you're actually becoming the foster agency that will create a new family for them. And is that what you're doing? You're just creating families, creating ohanas as you go along. That must be such a powerful feeling for all of you and what you're doing there in Uganda. Well, it actually is a new family. Actually, it's a large family because these 10 children in this King's Kids home actually become part of the pastor's family. So the pastor themselves, he and his wife might have three or four children, but then there's 10 more children. They have 14 children and they really are the mommy and daddy to those children being that role model for them. So even as far as walking the children to school in the morning, they've got a large family and they're thrilled with it because they do have a heart for the orphans. Wow. And um, do you actually provide means like food and clothing for the family throughout the course of the year? I mean, that's like a, a, a family overnight. Normally when you're pregnant and you have a, you're expecting a child, you have nine months to prepare. In this situation, Maybe sometimes two children might come in at a time and you're really not really prepared for it. So how is that done? Well, fortunately, we're surrounded with a great board of directors and uh, a circle of family and friends who pray for the children, write letters to the children and provide financial support. Without them, we couldn't possibly do that. Uh, but yes, through the, you know, through sponsors who care for our children, uh, we are able to provide food for the children and clothing and medical supplies and nurturing them back to health. Because oftentimes the children, when need, we get them, they're of ill health and it takes three to six months of medical care to get them back to a healthy condition. Wow. So, so the so local church, they, they provide the food that we, money is sent to them. They mm -hmm. buy the food to make sure the children have their needs met. And so it's that local church that is doing that. And even the congregation comes and brings gifts to the children as, uh, as a love offering to them like to help. a regular support. community. It is. Right? It is. The whole community is involved in this. And, wow. and, the, and the people watching this aren't seeing this as something that Chuck and Nancy are doing or the King's Kids is doing. The local villagers are watching this scene. Wow, look what that church is doing for those orphan children. Right. right. And, you know, what are some of the conditions that the children come to you in? They're not, you know, I mean... I, I, I don't know. I don't even know, want to see any pictures, but if you do have them, that'd be great. But <laughs> what are some of the conditions well, that those children come to you uh, with? Well, one of the abnormal things is that goes wrong is malaria, of course. It's a big problem. And so having fresh water for them certainly helps with that. They're not having to scrounge around in a mosquito infested area trying to find water. So we make sure that each house has a well uh, that's functioning properly, that they get fresh water. So they have the fresh water, they have a clean house to live in, they have beds for the first time in their lives, and there are mosquito nets over their beds. So ex making malaria be um, out of the option, that's a big help. Of course, the fresh food is as well. But in addition to the physical needs and conditions they come in, it's the emotional side that half these children that we get, they've lost both their mother and father to AIDS and some other family member, an extended family member, tries to raise the children, but often they have many children at their home or they're too elderly to care for them. And then the other half of the children have been abandoned or abused by their families. And uh, those are the most heart-wrenching mm -hmm. stories, but. Wow, I, that must be the hardest part. I mean, the joy is that you find them and you find and you place mm -hmm. them into a ohana and you're giving them all the love and nurturing they need, but the initial part of that journey, it, it is heart-wrenching, I'm sure. 
just finding mm -hmm. them and deciding who gets to go home with their new found family and who doesn't. So that's why I think the need for more and more um, volunteers slash donors that we could actually build more homes and provide for these children off the street so that they can be, you know, just like our Kiki, right? Is that what the goal is, is to try and help as many as we can. So, you know, feeding all these Kiki, all these children of the street, how, how is that done? I mean, are there farms or how do you provide all that food for all those Kikis and families? Well, life in rural, rural Uganda is difficult. And uh, but we're coming alongside the local churches and trying to coach them in uh, sustainability, uh, farming to increase crop production and sowing. Yeah, so if they can make um, something and get money from it, then they're able to buy more food for the children and help support them. So these little children can pack away a lot of food and it's not so often that they get meat, but when we go there, we make sure there's a banquet for these children, that there's a big party for them and the villagers, and they're all so happy and they clean their plates. There's not a speck of food left on those mm. plates. These children are amazing. They, they are so happy to have this good food. Wow, and so you mentioned that they have chicken and they have some uh, meat products. How readily available is that to get to the families? Well, they buy that, um, I think, monthly, and it's stored in the kitchen that um, we make for them. Now, you can't think of a kitchen like we think of a kitchen. It's just a storeroom, concrete floor, and where they cook is off a concrete floor with some coals. They use coal, and so they're using a lot of rice. There's rice, and there are fruits, and many of the fruits, as in Hawaii, we were surprised the first time to see that the climate was much like here with the same fruits grown. So they have those fruits. And a lot of the, the pastors are, it's a farming area where we're very, very rural. There's no electricity or anything. And so it's a very rural area where our homes are spread out in about, probably about 15, 20 miles away from each other. These homes aren't all together. And um, so they're farmers. So they raise, they do that. They grow crops and they raise cattle. And so it's, easy to get to. There are chickens all around, just like there are here in Hawaii as well. <laughs> so free range grass, um, grain fed chickens that are, that taste like chicken. Is that correct? Right. Right. Yeah. You know, so yeah. I was studying Uganda and I noticed that the food, the produce is very lush. You know, I, mm -hmm. I, so I guess water is not an issue and they have water so that they can grow this lush produce. Is that correct? Oh, uh Water is available in the rainy seasons. If there's droughts though, they for, struggle for survival. Um, but we do, that is one of the most important things in sustaining the, the health of the children is fresh water. So we make sure that all of our homes have fresh water immediately there through deep water wells available nearby. Which they can use as irrigation too. And they're encouraged to grow gardens and, and to grow their own food right there on the church property if there's space. Wow, that's a big issue right there. If they've got water, they've got life, right? I mean, Absolutely. running water Absolutely. is the key to life. And if they've got that happening, then that's amazing for them. So they're being blessed. And then you come along, along with a, a community, the awareness of the situation. And I don't want to call it a problem, but it's a situation that we need to address. And if by all means, we have the means to take and help take care of the problem with them, then that's what we're going to do as we become more aware of the situations back there in Uganda. And we're so okay. really grateful that you too, along with a lot of <clears throat> other hearts that follow your guide with King's Kids Africa, um, we're so grateful that you're here and that you're sharing a little bit of, of heart into that community as we spread the aloha and your aloha in your, in your hearts through that part of the world. So Chuck and Nancy, we are going to take a 60 second break. And when we come back, we'll learn more about the Kiki in Uganda and what's being done to get them to be just like us, <laughs> grown ups, <laughs> happy and healthy. Thank you, Mama. All right, aloha. Aloha, I'm Keisha King, host of At the Crossroads, where we have conversations that are real and relevant. We have spoken with community leaders from right here locally in Hawaii and all around the world. Won't you join us on thinktechhawaii.com or on YouTube on the ThinkTech Hawaii channel. Our conversations are real, relevant, and lots of fun. I'll see you 
at the crossroads. Aloha. Aloha and welcome. My name is Mark Shklov. I am the host of Think Tech Hawaii's Law Across the Sea program. Uh, every other Monday at one o'clock, I am here on deck with various guests talking about different topics of the world and the ocean and international law, different areas where we all have seen and want to travel to and learn about. Please join me for my next Law Across the Sea program. Aloha. Aloha and welcome back. Today we are very honored to have Chuck and Nancy Reed here back in Hawaii with us um, as they venture off to Uganda in May. What do they do in Uganda? Uh, well, they form the organization called King's Kids Africa. And what does that do? King's Kids Africa simply provides housing and a community around the children of the street. And what they're doing is they're finding these keikis and they put them together in a home with a mama. And then we here in Hawaii call it the Hanai system. So we're building a family of Ohana forever where she is the mama of these children and usually they're orphan children and um, or parents are not a a a around. So they're pretty much on their own. And what King's Kids Africa has done is put them in a home and giving them love, security, good nutritious food, water, and a lot of love. And I think that's so key to the success of this program is that there's a lot of aloha in there. And um, on our next slide, Chuck, we have you shown uh, with the boys. And what role do you play in these kids' lives, Chuck? Well, in Uganda, I'm called Papa Chuck. <laughs> and I've always loved being a father. So when I go to Uganda, I, I just want to love on the children and add to them an extra measure of joy in their life. Wow. And so you're Papa Chuck. I mean, how, how many keiki do you have around you at any given time? Oh, hundreds. <laughs> <laughs> hundreds. They, yeah. they swarm and they love the attention and the affection. And of course, we love to have them and give uh, it right back. What it's a not great... just the children of our house, because when we're there, it's all the other children in the village that come running mm. to play with Papa Chuck too. Right. And that's so important. I mean, Nancy, we're important too. But you know, in a keiki's life, the male role is so critical to have someone that they can love and nurture and be mentored by. And that will be what's going to shape that whole community mm -hmm. is the love mm -hmm. that the men can deliver to these keiki as the men in their lives are not present. So you are all, um, yes, Papa Chucks. And that's so critical. And, and, and Chuck, I'm sure that you're there also mentoring all the other men of the village so that they can continue on when Papa Chuck is on the road back in Hawaii or in Nashville, that you have raised the men up so that they can mentor those young boys to become men like you are and men with strong beliefs and, you know, just wisdom that will get them through mentoring the next generations. And I think that's what this is all about. It's not just about this generation and these keiki, but it's about what you're creating to create a better Uganda. Am I correct? Absolutely, absolutely. And we do encourage the men to be involved, to help with projects around the house and with teaching the children their Bible verses and, and the homework. That's a lot of teaching. I'm, how long, when you go there, what's your duration of stay? Usually we stay just two weeks and we long for more. And, and actually we haven't even said that so far we built six of the homes and we have five more that are committed for 2020. So this is gonna be a remarkable year and uh, we just can't wait. It's not so much about the bricks and mortar, it's the lives that are gonna be transformed and rescued. Wow, that's exciting. And you know, I, I, I have to add, um, that's when I said, we got to do something here in Hawaii. And so I said, hey, come on, people of Hawaii, let's jump in and be responsible for our house. And when I did ask Chuck and Nancy, what house number are you on? And they said, number six. So then I said, hey, can the people of Hawaii be responsible for house number seven? And we want to call it the house of Aloha. And we want to also put a tagline that it's Keakua's Hale with Keakua's Ohana within. And so we're really excited that 
people of the world of Hawaii will fundraise and be responsible to bringing just more aloha so that we can be a part of this, whether we never leave our shores of Hawaii or we do venture off to Uganda, we will have a role, an active role in this very great venture of both of you and all the people that you have gathered around to be a part of King's Kids Africa. So Nancy, I know that you're like a hobbyist, a crafter, you do everything under the sun, you can create uh, a house with just stones and mud by yourself. I know you can do this, but what is your exact role there when you go to Uganda? Well, I am Mama Nancy, and when we <laughs> arrive, children come running. When you come with us, Hawaii, you'll see the children come running towards you, just greeting you, just joyful, happy children. So what I do with a bunch of friends all winter is I sew clothes for the children. So here they are showing off their new skirts and the boys have new shorts, the girls have new skirts and new dresses. So that's something that I've done through the years so far is helping them that way. I'm also there to help teach them. I take them games. Now they're getting older, it's strategy games. So they have to think a little harder, maybe some painting and different crafts that I do with them. But we just have so much fun with them and they love to see what we're about to take out of that magic storage box we bring. Wow. And I think even if you just brought a stick and a book or anything yeah. out of that magic box, it yeah. would be magic because, you know, Chuck mm -hmm. and Nancy, when we think about the old days when we were raised uh, and we were growing up, we would play for hours with just jacks or just a rope and just <laughs> jump rope all day. And I've seen videos where you all had the villagers come out and you were just jumping rope, just like we used to do when we were keiki. And yeah. I think how valuable is that, that even here in Hawaii or many parts of the world, our keiki are not being exposed to that. And we're missing that part. So those kids are so blessed as you bless them. And I'm sure it's good for you both. It makes you guys younger because you guys get to go back and be kids again. And doesn't that feel great? Yeah. Now, we get to relive it, but what was really funny this year is when we took the jump ropes out, usually the children are coming around and all the village kids come to see what we're going to teach them, and they're all practicing jump rope. Well, we were surprised this year at one of the houses when we went that the, it was the mamas and the pastor's wife and the helpers, the ladies that grabbed the jump ropes, and they were jumping in. So it was the whole community was involved in our jump rope day. Wow. And see, that's the whole part of it. Is And you know... When you all go there, you want to go and help the kids, help the kids. But you know what? You guys are helping not only the adults, but you're helping both of you to become younger, happier, and, you know, just revert back to the good old days of when we were keiki ourselves. And that's so yeah. important that we get to do that, right? Instead well, when, of you think being... of traditional or... when you think of traditional orphan care, so often the children are isolated. And so as Nancy has talked about, you know, the children are going into the community and interacting and the community is coming to interact with the children. And so that's so positive, healthy for uh, future role modeling. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yes. You know, I've been to uh, many orphan orphanages in other countries, in third world countries, and it's exactly that. They just are confined. I mean, of course, the, the orphanages that I went to were where the keiki were with cerebral palsy, um, focused or or polio orphanages and yes all they do is see four walls in fact they don't even see the four walls some of them are just laying in the beds and seeing the roofs 24 hours a day never seeing the outside and it's very sad so what we are what you're doing with king's kids africa is you're bringing the world to them and opening their hearts and minds up to dare to dream and dare to you know just be cakey growing up into young respectful adults is so critical what you're doing. You're building a country and it's just commendable. I'm excited about that. You know, I, I we saw earlier the picture of that house. What is what what are the costs like to build a home there in Uganda? How, how is that done? To build one of our homes uh, costs about $25,000. And that's again, one of the homes with 10 children. Um, and along with the home is included within that $25,000 is a separate kitchen and latrine. Um, and then in addition to that, so that's 25,000, but we actually budget 30,000 because the other 5,000 is for beds, kitchenware, and then also healthcare, to, yeah, mm -hmm. healthcare to nurture the children back to health when they first arrive. Wow. Yeah. And that medical bill must be quite large because I've seen some of the keiki and um, that we can breathe life back into them where they, I saw that some are just skin and bone and um, to just be able to love and nurture that 
child into those bubbly, happy, smiling faces with the big eyes just staring at you. I mean, I think that's the part that makes it so rewarding when you see the difference that you've done, you know, in the past three years. And uh, that I think propels you just to just continue on. And I know that you'll never stop. Is that correct? Yes. And another unique thing about our ministry is that recently we had two children that came down with malaria and we were able to connect them with their sponsors. And one of the sponsors was a, a songwriter and she was over in Europe at the time. And they, they composed a song and sang it and sent it back to little Le, Le, Levert who had had malaria. And so we have that interaction between the sponsor and the children wow. as well. And just that love getting them through that part of their lives where in the past, I think they may not make it. So that's okay. just so amazing. You know, the, and then I know that when you produce these homes, it's also working towards sustainability. You're teaching them how to sustain on their own. And you're not just there doing everything for them, but you're teaching them to be, you know, like-minded citizens of the community and to continue to grow. Is that correct? Yes, we have, we have been working with the pastors in particular who have an agricultural background, but introducing them to a smart farming program to uh, increase crop production. And then Nancy has a dynamic sewing ministry as well. Yeah, I see that sewing ministry, girl. I see that the sewing machines and all the beautiful uh, outfits that you make for them. That's incredible. I love it. I, I, there's a slide that we want to share that shows the women um, right there in the seam sewing area. I love it. And when we go up, we got to bring them some Hawaiian material so they get more aloha yes, yes. in their, in their <laughs> wear, right? Yes. I mean, yes. this is just so exciting that we can create. And, you know, maybe what we can do too is we can have like a sister city, of course, you know, like our sister house to Hawaii and, and let Hawaii uh -huh. or the people of the world have more, uh, you know, stake at it and, and just feel the involvement that uh, we can do through you and what you are doing with the King's Kids Africa. You know, uh, um, I know our time is coming to an end. Is there anything that you really, in a quick nutshell, like to leave with our viewers before we close? Well, you know, we just want to say that when the first children first come to us, they're just hopeless. They have no, no, nothing on their faces, just blank faces, blank eyes you're looking into. But as time goes on, and actually very quickly, that changes. And these children now, we're seeing them step forward and telling us that they have hopes and they have dreams. One says they want to be a doctor, maybe an attorney, wow. a singer or a musician. And it's so right neat on. for us to see that, that we can do so that. That is so heartwarming. I just love yes. that, that we can make the difference and we can make a change. Yes. And we will yes. make a change together. We will. But we need to Absolutely. be wrapping up yeah. right now. And I'm mm -hmm. going to be talking to you more later. So for now, I'm going to have to say aloha, everyone. Aloha from King's Kids Africa. Woohoo! Aloha.